All right, good morning and welcome back to the 30-hour post-licensing course. Uh, I am uh, the instructor, Raymond Modulin, and my email is raymond at realuniversity.com. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email about this. So we are still talking about the fourth lesson here, and we are currently in the listing and purchase agreements, and we are moved on to the topic now uh, of earnest money. Now, I understand that this is the 30-hour course, and you guys, as graduates of this post-licensing course, will not be the one actually dealing with the earnest money uh, inside of your company, most probably. Uh, this is typically more something that's discussed with the 24-hour managing broker course. However, I think it is still very important for you to understand uh, at least the basics of how the earnest money and the earnest money system should work, all right? So typically, most banks, or most banks, <laughs> most brokerages will have two bank accounts, okay? So you're going to have one called the earnest money account and one called a general account. Usually that's at a minimum. I have seen some people have two earnest money accounts, and we can talk about that here in a minute and uh, explain why that would happen. So in the earnest money account is where all of the money that gets deposited that is being held in earnest for the buyer. All right. Now, in the general account would be all of the other money that is being held that would be used by the brokerage in some form. You know, you got to pay your rent, you got to pay out commissions, you got utilities and office supplies and, you know, all kinds of other things. In the earnest money, this is always considered a credit to the buyer. This money is held as a credit to the buyer and is held typically by the listing agent. All right. Now, one of the number one violations and one that is often caught is when a broker erroneously puts earnest money into the general account. All right. That whole definition is defined as commingling. All right. You are commingling other people's money with the brokerage money. That is, in fact, a violation of the Indiana's uh, administrative laws. So that's typically like one of the number one violations. Now, here's the problem. It doesn't really matter if it's on accident or if it was some subversive reason that that was happened. So you've got to be extremely careful on making sure that when you deposit earnest money checks, that they do in fact go into the right account. Now, the earnest money account must be in a, an account that is federally backed. So it's the FDIC or it can go into a credit union and there is a similar version of the FDIC for credit unions. And the reason the rule says this is so that somebody doesn't go, well, the earnest money account is my pocket or the front desk drawer of my uh, office. So it must be deposited by the person in charge to one of these types of entities. The next thing is it has to be deposited within two banking days. Very critical you understand that word. It is not business days, it is not calendar days. It is two banking days. So several exceptions stick out in my mind. One would be, I think, like Columbus Day, uh, Martin Luther King. Banks are closed, but businesses are open. So you must deposit the earnest money into the account. Once you receive it, 
within two banking days, all right? Do not get this confused with that new line we have in our purchase agreement that says we will deliver the earnest money within three days. This is the receipt of the earnest money. This rule declares once it's received, you have two banking days to put it in, all right? So that is the earnest money section. Now, there is another technical violation that is called conversion. So let's go back here and look at this for a second. Remember this commingling that we talked about right here. If you accidentally put the earnest money into the general account and then you wrote, let's say you did this on uh, January the 1st of some year. And then on January the 3rd of that same year, you went out and you paid your light bill. That's my light bulb. The fact is, this earnest money was in your account and then you wrote money out of that account to some use that would be deemed private by the public. That whole process is called conversion. Conversion. You have converted someone else's money without their permission to a private use. Now, I know that people will go, well, I wasn't that dollar. Unfortunately, you can't dictate which dollar because once it goes into this general banking account, think about it just like throwing pile on a, or money on the pile. Then you reach in and take money out of the pile. You can't guarantee it's not, so they automatically assume it is. So typically you see commingling and conversion being used together when the violation is handed down because you put money into your account and then you spent money and you converted it, all right? So typically those go together. You see the terms commingling and conversion used almost always together, all right? So now the next question I want to talk about, this is one that a lot of people have a misconception about and I believe it's just because they don't want to have to explain the actual rules to the agent. But the question is, can an earnest money account accrue interest? If you want to hit pause and think about it for a minute, feel free to do that. But can an earnest money account accrue interest? And the answer to that is a resounding Yes, it can, all right? Earnest money accounts can accrue interest. The problem with this is, or where most people automatically make the assumption, is the broker cannot obviously profit from that interest. So I can't keep the interest earned on someone else's money. It must be returned to them. So they give you the $500 earnest money, and then all of a sudden when you go to close, you go ahead and write the earnest money check out. All right? So you see the problem with that? You have to track what each earnest money would do. So what most brokers end up saying is this. No to earning interest. They have their earnest money account be a non-interest bearing account. That way we don't have to worry about this kind of problem, okay? Now, there is a very special, unique situation that is allowed for that a earnest money account can earn interest and then that interest can get paid out to some kind of nonprofit housing organization in the name of the person who put the earnest money in there. So they can get handed out to a 501c3 and that would allow that seven cents to go to like Indiana housing, okay? 
Now, if that is something that is checked in the purchase agreement, I would suggest you might want to go out and make a special earnest money account for that one. So you open it, and then when you close it, you take the 500, go to the closing, and donate that to the Indiana Housing Authority. All right? So there are cases when the earnest money can be donated, uh, but it has to be upon the request and the permission of the buyer. All right? <clears throat> what constitutes earnest money? Well, that's a good question. Earnest money is typically considered cash or an equivalent. Well, everybody understands what cash is. It's the equivalent part that is ha that's the problem. I have actually seen, and I don't know if I can do this, just because I think it's cool. I have seen diamonds given to be held, and I also saw, actually I was involved in this one, the title to a Lincoln Navigator was given to the seller by the buyer. Now that is a case where we, the seller, actually held that in the safe, the title, it's supposed to be a safe. And then we gave it back to the buyer when the deal closed. This was a case of the buyer was getting a 100% loan and did have very little cash, but actually had a free and clear navigator. And he titled and deeded the car over to the seller and we held it in a safe. And then at closing, we gave it back. So typically you can accept anything other than cash but you need the seller's permission to accept anything other than cash. That's what the rule says. So you could accept loose diamonds. You could accept the title to a car. Uh, you could accept an IOU in theory. All right. Uh, tracking your earnest money is the, probably the hugest, hugest, biggest problem that you have. Because what happens is when it goes into a bank, the problem is, is it gets thrown in there with all the other money that's in the account. And then when your client, your agent comes to you and goes, hey, remember that $500 I gave you 40 days ago? I need to take that back out. And then you look over here at this account and you go, oops, uh, did we get it? Because that was five, you know, 30 days ago. And is it hidden somewhere in this balance that I've got? So you have got to find a way to track that earnest money. One of the older ways to do it before electronic banking was you had a property card for each property and you would record a $500 credit on that property card. And then you had a separate card where it had all of the properties like a master list. And when that 500 would go in there, then it would also go in here so you could see, you know, blah, 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 to get your balance. And it matches with what's in your bank account. And then when the, some, your agent came and said, hey, I need to close, and I'm closing on that 12 Smith Street property, you would pull that card out and see that plus 500 and then you would go, okay, I'll write you a check for 500 and therefore that property, as far as the earnest money goes, is closed and then you would have another entry here that would subtract off, let's make that the original 500 in black. Then you would have your master list where it would show to zero now your total's 23,250. And when the check comes out of your bank, your bank balance would be that 23,250. So you better find a way to track this. And that is probably one of the largest problems because like I said, you may get earnest money in January and the property may not close till February or March. And then you've got to remember, oh, did we get that check? Oh, I don't remember that, especially if you're starting or working in a brokerage that's got 
20, 30, 40, 80, 100 agents, you can't do that from memory. Now with electronic checking, the way things go in, when it gets posted on your ledger, on your online banking, you can actually go in and add a note to it and say, oh yeah, that was 12 Smith Street. So that when you go to close it and you write the check, you would write it as 12 Smith Street and there's your offsetting balances. So tracking the earnest money is a very difficult process and can be very daunting and lead to a lot of hours of auditing your own system if you make one little slip up, okay? So the last question is, and we've touched on, does earnest money make it the deal? So the question is, is earnest money required? The answer is no, it's not, all right? Unless you put it in the offer and make it one of the items in the offer, then it is required. So you literally could write an offer and put zero earnest money. There is no rule or law in place that requires you to have earnest money. But if you write $500 in, then yes, now it is required and you must deliver the $500 as earnest money. We covered already that one section that talks about the earnest money not being delivered in that time frame that was specified. And there are many people that erroneously believe that the deal is void. And I use that word. If you remember, I don't like that word. No, that deal becomes voidable. It can be undone. And the IAR's attorneys have said, if you were expecting earnest money in two days and you didn't get it, you should at least give them a warning to say you are in violation and you have 24 hours to correct that violation. You can't just say, oh, the deal's void and put it back on the market, all right? Any questions, give me an email. We're gonna come right back here in just a second.